Kitty Marion was born Katerina Marie Schaefer on March 12, 1871, in Germany. Her mother died of tuberculosis when she was two years old. Just four years later, her stepmother and a new baby brother died suddenly as well. Wishing she had disappeared right along with them, Kitty was now left alone with her father, Gustav. He was a forbidding, austere man prone to violence. In her unpublished autobiography, Kitty remembered her father bringing home a small dog as a gift. But after noticing the dog preferring Kitty, Gustav began to kick it to death in front of her. When she started to flourish into a beautiful young woman with striking red hair and a robust singing voice, the beatings would become a daily occurrence. Once, after noticing her hair hung differently and finding out later that she had tried to cut it in the latest fashion, Gustav struck her full force in the face. The next morning, when it was clear that he had broken her nose, Gustav laughed and told her that it was an improvement to her beauty. He also promised her that if she ever behaved in an unladylike manner again, he would see to it that both her legs were pummeled beyond repair. Kitty left school at 15, and after one especially violent attack from her father in front of the entire extended family, she was sent to live with her Aunt Dora in England. Kitty arrived alone in London's East End in 1886 at 15 years old, not speaking a word of English, and just two years before the city was shaken by the savage murders of Jack the Ripper. And though Kitty had escaped the abuse of her father, she soon found herself in the role of domestic servant for Aunt Dora and her six children. One day, Kitty saw an ad in the London Daily News offering training for young ladies to dance on the stage. She jumped at the chance and eventually found success as a performer in London's famed music halls. This is when Katerina Marie Schaefer changed her name to Kitty Marion. But success came at a price. Practically every encounter with a music hall agent resulted in some form of sexual harassment. In the late 19th century, a young woman looking for work in the music halls without any form of male protection was no easy task. She suffered through countless humiliations and predatory aggressions. The agents were used to young women who were too fearful to refuse their advances or make a scene, but Kitty was different. She responded with a fury that the agents were not accustomed to, and with great determination and resolve, she managed to secure work for herself without trading sex or yielding to intimidation. Kitty was resolute that she would stay independent from the control of a man. After narrowly escaping one of many assaults by an agent, she wrote, Sometime later, while discussing him and his ilk, as we often did in the dressing room, one of his sister team told me that she had gotten used to it, that when first she resented the same overtures, he laughed at her and said, I've had your sister, why shouldn't I have you? In 1908, after an attempted rape by an agent in the back of a cab, Kitty decided she would not suffer another attack and went to the police. They responded with laughter and told her to find work as a maid. In June of 1908, 3,000 people marched in Hyde Park for women's suffrage. It was one of the largest gatherings to date for the Women's Social and Political Union, the WSPU. For decades, they'd been pushing Parliament to give women the right to vote and been ignored. As early as 1832, a woman named Mary Smith requested a petition to give unmarried, tax-paying women the right to vote. She was laughed out of Parliament. Now, in the first decade of the 20th century, the WSPU changed their motto to deeds, not words, and their tactics became increasingly radical. They began with public outbursts and physical confrontations with police. Eventually, it escalated to large-scale arson attacks and bombings. The Daily Mail had coined the term suffragettes as a joke, a patronizing attempt to trivialize the cause. But the WSPU embraced the term, and it was to become a powerful symbol 
of a very unladylike female rebellion. That day in June, when Kitty found herself swept up by the march in Hyde Park, she was overwhelmed. It was a revelation she would write about later. I heard my own ideas expressed so much better than I could ever express them. The scales were falling from my eyes and I recognized the other mad women. The women who'd actually been demanding change in conditions which I'd practically only been talking in my dreams. Now I was awake. Kitty began taking part in serious protests with the suffragettes. She showed her commitment to the cause by offering to sell the Votes for Women newspaper in the public square. This was what they called an acid test, as selling the Votes for Women newspaper was one of the most demeaning tasks the members of the WSPU were asked to perform. They would be confronted with a constant barrage of insults from both men and women, as well as the persistent threat of assault. Kitty stationed herself at the various central hubs of London, waving the newspaper and shouting, Votes for Women, with her powerful music hall voice. She later wrote, Some of my friends always thought I was crazy, now they were sure. Minnie Hayden, whom I happened to meet doing the rounds of the agents one day, told me she was too disgusted to ever speak to me again. Eventually, Kitty's confrontations with the agents made it more and more difficult to obtain singing engagements. During a union meeting for the Variety Artist Federation, Kitty sat through a chairman droning on over a list of irrelevant complaints before finally standing up and shouting over him, They won't give me work because I won't kiss them. The room sat shocked and silent for a moment, and then a thunderous applause. Shouts of bravo. Finally, a public objection from a woman of sexual harassment had now been spoken loud and clear in a collective setting. The chairman of the event called out to Kitty and asked if she would give a written statement to London County Council to expose these abuses and identify those who should be held accountable. She did, and all prospects of work for Kitty Marion vanished virtually overnight. Engagements she had been booked for canceled her appearances, and while she became something of a figurehead for the movement among female performers in the industry, she was now essentially blackballed. After investigating Kitty's allegations, the council found no improprieties had been committed, and the matter all but evaporated. Kitty immersed herself in all the branches and networks of the WSPU across the country. She wrote letters, campaigned, and later would become the most ferocious crusader of the suffragettes. The WSPU are mostly remembered by history as peaceful protesters who occasionally would chain themselves to railings, but the reality was far more brutal. The more they were ignored and patronized by Parliament, the more violent their attacks became. It's believed that Kitty was part of a small group of radicalized young women that secretly formed within the WSPU. They called themselves the Young Hotbloods. These were the most dangerous suffragettes of all, and Kitty's dedication was absolute. The Young Hotbloods were responsible for hundreds of bomb and arson attacks, carried out using code names and aliases, destroying banks, newspaper offices, railway stations, cotton mills, timber yards, sporting pavilions, churches burned to the ground, chemical attacks on post boxes, golfing greens, and even the Prime Minister whenever a suffragette managed to get close enough. They cut communication systems across the country from London to Glasgow. Kitty became one of the most prolific and skilled arsonists of the movement, and like many suffragettes, she was arrested countless times. In her fifth large-scale arson attack, she teamed up with fellow suffragette Clara Gavine to set fire to the grandstand at Hurst Park Racecourse. On June 8, 1913, Kitty had packed a wicker suitcase with a gallon of oil and fire lighters. In the dark, Kitty and Clara made their way across the wet grass to the grandstand. Somehow, in their course and heavy Edwardian skirts, they managed to not only climb a towering fence with barbed wire, but they did it with a rolled up carpet and wicker suitcase filled with munitions. 
After having scrambled over the fence, it was almost midnight when they found an open door that gave entrance into the large, empty pavilion. Every slight noise they made echoed throughout the cavernous space. After spreading oil around the surfaces of the pavilion, Kitty placed a candle at the center. This was a common tactic for Kitty's arson attacks. The candle melted slowly, leaving them plenty of time to escape before the flame reached the oil-soaked base. It also allowed time to arrange a strong alibi. The candle would give them an hour before the flame reached ignition, but something went wrong. The fire suddenly surged all around them. They scrambled to find the door through a thick veil of smoke, choking on the fumes. They lifted their heavy skirts, the hems of which were now dampened with oil, and sprinted through the flames, somehow only slightly scorched. As they raced toward the fence, the blaze had already lit up the night sky, and the sound of an alarm began pounding over the turf. Bruised and wet, they struggled back over the barbed wire fence and made their way back to a safe house that had been arranged for them. It was a three-hour walk to avoid being seen, but they soon realized the police were already watching the safe house. Kitty knew their escape was now impossible, and by morning they were taken into custody. The grandstand had been reduced to a pile of smoldering ash, and all that was left were the placards Kitty placed in the pavilion that read, Burning for the vote. For the vote. Throughout her many arrests, Kitty continued her rebellion in prison. Once, after being brought to her cell, she barricaded herself in. It took the guards 24 hours to gain access, as they were forced to chisel off the door hinges. Later, she set fire to the mattress and reduced her cell to a seething black pit, almost burning herself in the process. While incarcerated, Kitty refused to feed or clothe herself. The WSPU agreed to show their solidarity by going on group hunger strikes while in prison. Initially, to avoid the public hearing stories of women dying in jail, Parliament decided to release the suffragettes early. But after continued attacks and arrests, it was decided the WSPU inmates would be force-fed. This was a grueling torture that began with each limb being held down by separate guards to an armchair. A thick tube was fed through the nostril and pushed 20 inches down the throat. It gave a sharp sensation of choking and suffocation, causing the eyes to bulge and extend from the sockets, accompanied by an almost unbearable pressure against the eardrums. The procedure resulted in so much vomiting and convulsing that the clothes had to be changed afterwards. The food being fed down the tube was mostly milk, eggs, and beef tea. Kitty also noticed something with a peculiar salty taste, which she later learned was bromide, though the authorities denied it, as there was a great outcry for giving women sedative drugs in prison. The force feedings left many of the women with health problems for the rest of their lives. It was an experience Kitty would never forget, and by the time the First World War had begun in 1914, Kitty had been force-fed far more than any other inmate. She was put through a staggering 232 force feedings and was never able to sing again. By the time she'd been released from prison, she'd lost 36 pounds and looked like a woman of 70 rather than 43. The First World War brought with it a wave of anti-German attitudes, and the leaders of the suffragettes began to distance themselves from Kitty Marion. Fearing she would be deported back to Germany, she found passage to America and landed in New York City. With her voice ravaged from the force feedings, Kitty looked for work in the new medium of motion pictures, but her once beautiful appearance was now battle-scarred and weathered. She'd also acquired a notoriously dangerous international reputation as the actress turned militant suffragette. Kitty soon found herself indigent and was unable to afford food and lodgings. She disappeared from public view and found work as a maid under a pseudonym. Eventually, when she began to feel like herself again, she joined the birth control movement with Margaret Sanger. Headlines appeared in the papers about the missing suffragette who had suddenly reappeared to support the birth control cause. In 1917, it was illegal to promote any information regarding birth control, but Kitty stood on New York street corners from Times Square to Coney Island and sold Sanger's magazine, The Birth Control Review. She was arrested many times by NYPD, but never stopped until she was dismissed 
13 years later. By 1921, Margaret Sanger's organization had grown at such a pace across the country that it was renamed the American Birth Control League. 20 years later, it would be renamed again Planned Parenthood. By 1931, Kitty was 60 and out of work. She called on Margaret Sanger to see if there was any way she could be of service, but to Kitty's utter disappointment, they seemed to want nothing to do with her. Regarded as an old battle axe, who seemed like a relic from the early part of the movement, Kitty was once again discarded by a cause she had fought so passionately for, and now survived on handouts from old friends. After all her crusades, imprisonments, and physical impairments, Kitty was left with next to nothing to live on. Her final years would be spent working in the office of the Women's Peace Society for $10 a week. As the Second World War approached, Kitty embraced this new movement whose motto was passivism instead of combativeness. She felt a kind of spiritual shift. Kitty wrote of all her arson attacks, I hated the whole wretched business we all did and would much rather have had the vote than do this sort of thing to get it. But we did our duty as we saw it, much like soldiers on the principle of theirs is not to reason why. As Kitty approached 70, her natural fortitude refused to allow her to simply fade away quietly. She had written an unflinching memoir that reflected the true suffragette movement with all its passions and brutality. She'd sent a copy of the manuscript to Edith Howe Martin, who had set up the Suffragette Fellowship in 1926 to conserve and protect the memory of the WSPU. One can only imagine how Kitty's frank and explicit recounting of events must have been received by the Fellowship, who had already tried to downplay the more violent aspects of the movement. Her book was all but buried by the Fellowship, and there are few records of Kitty after 1934, except for one letter she'd written to Edith following her manuscript. She wrote, You say in your letter how difficult it is to get money, hence no hope for my book. I didn't ask for money, merely to have the manuscript read by some of you, and an opinion given as to if anything could be done with it and make an effort to get it published. Kitty Marion died impoverished and alone in Manhattan at 73 on the 9th of October, 1944, as a naturalized citizen of the last country to give her refuge. <laughs>